to this event. Um, I, I particularly like to, to, to welcome uh, the uh, am ambassador um, to Chile from the UK, uh, Luisa de Sosa, who is going to say a few words in a moment uh, to introduce this event. Um, and that really recognises the support uh, that we've had at the University of Nottingham, Chile, uh, and the Universidad de Talca for, for some work that we're reporting on uh, later on in this event. Um, I'd like to also invite all our speakers, uh, particularly those who've got up very early in the morning to, to be with us uh, uh, today. Um, it's great. One of the great things about being online is being able to bring people together, which maybe we wouldn't be able to do if we were all in one place. Um, we're dealing today with uh, microgrids for isolated and rural communities. And we've got various examples uh, of this uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, and also an audience that I can see uh, is truly global as well. So I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this event. I think the importance of electrical energy in these rural, in rural communities has only been highlighted by COVID-19 uh, and the need for communications uh, around uh, countries and around the world. So uh, it's going to be really good to see some of the solutions uh, and some of the implementations uh, in the presentations today. Um, but uh, without any more ado, I, I'll hand over to, uh, uh, to, to Louisa um, to put for your introduction. Uh, Louisa, I hope you're there. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Wheeler. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar, um, looking at uh, microgrids for isolated and rural communities um, supported by the British Embassy in Santiago. And first of all, I would like to thank the team at the University of Nottingham, Chile and the University of Talca for organizing this event. Uh, the University of Nottingham has a proud record of collaboration uh, in Chile on subjects ranging from astronomy to health sciences, engineering to sociolinguistics, dating back many decades. And the launch of the University of Nottingham, Chile in 2018 um, has further boosted this relationship. And I would like to thank Professor Wheeler and Mariana Rojas for all their work to make this project and this event a success. The collaboration is also due to the fine efforts of the team at the University of Talca, led by Professor Rivera, and thank you to you as well. The UK and Chile, of course, have a long history of partnership across a broad range of areas, including the recent Newton Picarte Fund that boosted science and innovation collaboration in a range of disciplines. The UK is Chile's third largest international partner for research, with collaboration growing year on year. As the incoming president of COP26, the UK is working closely with Chile's COP25 presidency to bring governments, investors, business and civil society together to ensure that the clean energy sector continues to grow and make clean technologies available to all people and not only those in urban areas. With this in mind, I'm delighted to see this event, an example of the grassroots work being done between the UK and Chile to promote collaboration in inclusive access to clean energy systems. The supply of reliable, resilient and green energy is key for sustaining global value chains as well as localised production. The Inter-American Development Bank estimates that energy use in Latin America has more than tripled over the past 40 years. I'm pleased that Chile is prioritising the use of its abundant natural resources of renewable energy to meet this demand. As of 2018, 98.3% of the population in Latin America had access to electricity. Yet despite the infrastructure development in recent decades, some communities still face important challenges to secure a reliable electrical energy supply, especially in rural and remote areas. And this is where microgrids can help to deliver cheap and resilient renewable energy to rural communities all over the world by making energy supply more reliable and sustainable and contributing to decarbonisation of this sector. Having a cheap and reliable source of electricity also supports development and education for remote communities. So it is wonderful to see examples today of how microgrids are supporting girls' education in Guatemala and isolated groups in Paraguay. 
Here in Chile, microgrids are having an impact in providing reliable electricity to the Mapuche community. Microgrids also help optimize agricultural production through the integration of technologically simple solutions for growing crops while preserving water resources, promoting sustainability and promoting resilience in rural farming. Today, you will hear about projects developed in Latin America that demonstrate that microgrids are a sustainable technological solution across the region. They have high potential for wider use in a range of environments and climates and represent an opportunity to close the gap in access to clean electricity that still exists in this region, particularly in rural and remote areas. I wish you well for the event. Um, I think it will be fascinating and I hope it's inspirational to those of you looking for, to develop projects and initiatives um, of this sort to, to tackle the problems that this project has particularly addressed. And I'll hand back to Professor Wheeler and thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Uh, uh, th thank you very much for, for, for those words and uh, uh, the encouragement uh, that we've had in, in, in our project uh, at the University of, of Nottingham, Chile. Um, and, and thank you very much for attending this morning. It's, uh, it's very good to see you here. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to waste too much time um, with, with more introductions. I'd really like to um, encourage everyone to ask questions as we go through these presentations. Uh, and you can do that using the chat function um within zoom and we'll pick up on those questions at the end or by raising your hand at the end of uh, of each presentation um i would like therefore to introduce uh, the the first presentation um i would like to say our speaker probably needs no great introduction to many of us um rodrigo palma uh, is with the uh, universidad de, de chile uh, and his presentation is around uh, the first microgrid in Chile, um, uh, one of the projects. Um, you'll have to forgive me for my translations here. I, I, I have a very good um, uh, short CV for Rodrigo, but it is in Spanish. My Spanish is not brilliant. Um, but uh, uh, Rodrigo received his PhD in 1999 from the University of Dortmund in Germany. And he is now a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and the Center for Energy at the uh, Universidad de Chile in Santiago. He, he's widely published in the area of um, electrical energy, particularly in the areas of renewable energy and solar energy, uh, as well as microgrids uh, and access to energy. And uh, I believe we're going to see, hear some of that uh, today. So, Rodrigo, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, Pat, for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation and this great opportunity for our group. Um, I would share now my screen so you, you can see that. I hope it's okay. You can see the screen. Mm -hmm. yep. oh, yes, yes, you can see. Um, finally, we extend a little bit the scope of the presentation to show you, of course, microgrids and Guatacondo, the first microgrid in Chile, but also to talk to you a little bit about the process of um, what we follow the past 15 years in the field of productive solar energy solutions for communities. Uh, of course, this is not my work, it's a big group of persons that are working inside the energy center. Uh, we put together many slides, so I, I, I will try to make a dynamic presentation showing you different aspects of this very uh, critical and impressive challenge for the world, which is the decentralized energy solution. The presentation is arranged in these six points, and I will start with the introduction, followed by the co-construction co -construction methodology. Um, go through some, some of the issues um, when you work on these projects and to try to finish with conclusions and challenges. Um, the big change. So this is a traditional power system and we will, what we will face with these new drivers, especially climate change, as mentioned before, uh, and in the framework of COP25 and 26, Chile and UK are really in a very special moment uh, in this transition. And 
Of course, the security issues and social opposition, which is a special aspect in Chile, we, we are looking social opposition, I mean, for the traditional conventional projects, for example, nuclear energy or the big dam-based hydropower. Um, we are facing a, a, a push and a, a shift to a, a new way to supply energy in combination with the traditional one. And this is our expectation. This is a reality in many places in the world. But um, in Chile, we are just starting. Huh? In, in fact, in Chile, we, we follow more these trends. You will see big PV power plants, big um, um, uh, wind power plants, uh, and less uh, uh, development of distributed generation in general. Of course, in the field of rural areas, we have some progress in, in, in energy solutions, as uh, you will see in the presentation. The microgrid concept, um, you can understand it if you are coupled to a traditional distribution system the, the, through this point of common coupling, it's like a subset of a, of a distribution network. Um, distributed energy resources are allocated in the way you can operate in an independent way with a good coordination. And this is the definition of a microgrid, a subsystem of a distribution system where you can really uh, work as an island system in the case you are connected. Or if you are isolated, we define it as an islanding microgrid, which is also a field of development itself. Um, here you can see uh, that there is no a clear or, or a, 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 a unique definition for a, what we call small. Uh, some people talk about some kilowatts when we talk about the microgrid and uh, other parts of the world are talking about megawatt or some few megawatts of uh, installed capacity. And here you can see, and you have as, as backup different uh, aspects uh, or attributes of, of a microgrid. Uh, in the case, it has enough capacity to supply all or at least most of the loads at the, of the local grid is one important attribute. So you are able to coordinate this about uh, using a central controller. There are also some distributed approaches, but the most traditional one is that you have a central controller able to manage all this combination of supply equipment and also loads. And in the middle also, you can see here some storage devices that are able to be part of the microgrid. There are, as mentioned before, uh, different approaches for the control. Uh, very nice discussions in, in, in the literature about advantages and disadvantages from uh, centralized control architectures and decentralized control architectures. There was a, important paper where we participate uh, with the trends in these issues. And depending on the special conditions and the, the evolution of a, a, a solution in a, in a place, you can see both centralized and decentralized approaches. Uh, in fact, uh, Latin America is progressing in, in this phenomena. Here you have some examples we collect uh, about microgrids in, in our region. And we are very happy to see um, year by year an important number of new initiatives. Um, many of them supported by local governments, by international um, organizations. But we hope that it will be part of the um, normal development based on economic uh, advantages that we will see in the near future. And what we have uh, is uh, this point of view that we have uh, the challenge in energy supply can divide in three main pillars. One is the energy efficiency programs, which is very important. And we need to mention energy efficiency as a pillar, which is not the traditional production of energy. It's, it's less energy to make the same or more energy or the same energy to make more. Uh, but on the and on the right side, the pillar of traditional supply solutions. And of course, in, in the middle here, we see the integration of huge potential of renewable-based distributed energy resources, which is a main characteristic of Latin America. It's impressive the amount of, of renewable energy that we have in Latin America. 
and we need to use this. This is our big expectation. And based on this microgrid definition, we define three main uh, subdivisions, what we call the coordinated microgrid, the islanding microgrid, and also a special family of emergency microgrids. And in the next slide, you can see a, a very uh, quick definition of this. Coordinated is what I mentioned before, is the microgrids that are inside the distribution system and are coordinated with the bulk power system. Uh, islanding microgrids is uh, the focus of, uh, in my understanding, of this seminar, which are uh, in normally in rural areas or far away from the main power system. And emergency microgrids can be both isolated or integrated. But we expect what we expect here, and it's very important for Chile, is the ability to have a special um, zone in a city, for example, as you can see in the figure, where based of natural disaster, a flood, uh, um, earthquake, etc., you are able to ensure that some part of the city is able to, to be resilient and to provide a basic energy solutions. And in a country like Chile, and I expect this is um, uh, overall the world, but especially in Chile, here is an example of the flood area in Arica. We, we really, really uh, need to supply some emergency loads or some critical loads. And this is um, an important development area in microgrids too. But you can see here, we, we see two main um, coordination approaches or design approaches, where you can expect a single agent microgrid for the future. This is a, um, a paper that we published in IEEE Power and Energy Magazine you know, in 2017. And we tried to show what will be the future in, in, in locations like Chile. And, and uh, this single agent is like decoupled from, from the distribution system, but we will also observe the multiple agent microgrids, which can be a subset of the distribution system owner that is able to operate as an island. And these two phenomena implies different incentives, different market designs, and we need to move forward to really understand how we can manage this, starting in the banks. Who will you finance one type or another type? We are at the very beginning on all the financial issues in microgrids. So microgrids opportunities, in this context is uh, remote locations are a main microgrid development opportunity, of course. Uh, uh, we can be, see that as part of the solution of, for climate change and ending uh, energy poverty. This is not only for rural areas, but with all the pandemia issues today, you can imagine that the nexus water, energy, and food, and healthy, if you want, is in one space of the territory is an important signal uh, for the future. So we really expect that uh, this is a very uh, important trend in the next years. Uh, here you can see also technological or technology drivers. Um, we observe a very important decline in the cost of solar PV solutions. Uh, we expect or we see um, not a decrease in the uh, diesel or in general petroleum prices. And, and we see also three primary segments uh, where, where uh, you, can, you can see developments in, in Chile. Here, an example, um, in, near in the surrounding area from mining facilities you, where you have a, 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 an industrial production, there, there is a space of development, and we see that in, in locations like El Toki mining facility where, where the development of microgrids uh, is a clear driver. In physical islands like the Eastern Island, this is of course of per definition a microgrid, and we also see the, this for Chile, we have many, many islands, and this is also the case in Latin America. And in village electrifications like Guatacondo, which is also an option as a cost-effective solution. Um, about electricity coverage in Latin America, um, here you can see um, recent, so two years ago, the state in, in our region about the electrification rate and population without electricity. So it still remains a, a very important challenge in Latin America. 
we are the, with good numbers in Chile, but if you make a double click and you see really the supply reliability in each part of the territory, uh, we are very far away from the reliability and comfort that is offered in other places in the world. So it's remained a challenge, but uh, of course, at regional level, the challenge is very big. So now we move to what we developed for many years um, in, in an interdisciplinary way. It's what we call the co-construction methodology. We try to understand how we can work uh, and create with the challenge uh, stated here, how to develop energy projects that foster the use of renewable energies and achieve improvements in the livelihoods of a community in the lasting manner. And based on that, we understand um, day by day better what, what uh, the real meaning of a socio-technical solution, which is not to buy an equipment and to install it in a community. There are many challenges related with how to uh, develop appropriate uh, solutions, technology solutions, and manage to establish a resilient socio-technical system in the context of successful energy transitions. This is our motivation. And based on this, we divide the analysis in, 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 in these three areas. You need to work really to create teams that are able to work in, uh, this is idealistic, uh, impressive, transdisciplinary is uh, not achieved by our group, but at least an interdisciplinary approach for that. And based on that, we develop a four stage uh, procedure. Um, I will not go in detail for in all this, uh, the steps, but I will show you examples how we understand uh, the stage one, the social technical diagnostic and team building. The two is social technical design and sustainability plan then the implementation and first impression based on the community reaction, and finally the operation, evaluation, and dissemination phase. And let me uh, move forward. You, you can see that in our papers where we propose this. Uh, I will give you the list, but here you have the specific steps or, or sub-steps in each stage that you need to uh, define. So, so let me go to some examples. This is Guatacondo. The main message of my presentation today, it is a town uh, in, in, in the northern part of our country, isolated from the main power grid, uh, 60 kilometers far away from a mining company uh, operation. And there is a town with around 100 um, people that uh, at that time face only seven hours per day uh, electricity. And since 2010, the, with this system that was the photovoltaic solution with one tracking system in the place where we are look, taking the photography was, because it's not active today, a, a small wind turbine. And here in one of these houses, we have the best, the battery energy storage system. This is uh, the, one of the diagnostic we follow and um, to show you the type of examples are moving also far away from from the case of Watakondo, where we need to energize this um, this town to provide 24 times seven energy solutions. Uh, we move forward here to another challenge that we face in another project with, with the Eastern Island, where we we need to work with the people in the island, and as you can see here. The, um, in the first phase where we pre, um, developed this diagnosis was close related with uh, 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 how you, you, you are able to connect to the people in a, in a symmetrical way to have a good conversation. And the solution for us was the creation of this representation of the island. It was a very big, we did transport this in, in, the, in the airplane to the island and with uh, different workshops and, and, and contact with the people and also with these dimensional um, tools showing the different technologies, we were able to develop this type of analysis. You can see the island and the people are taking, putting with the different colors, the different energy vectors or energy um, sources that they use in the different areas of the of the island. And the talk here is my house. Here I, I use this. 
and it was impressive the way uh, this type of tools instead of a PowerPoint, and I don't like to see any more a new PowerPoint presentation, how you can really uh, improve the dialogue. This is just an example to show you how we work with that. In the case of Guatacondo, we create a similar thing in 2009 around that. This is not a photography, it's a, how you say in English, is an op maqueta uh, from, from, the, from the town. Uh, technically, we call it boundary objects uh, and meetings. Here is the, the same representation. And the location of the, of the solar panels that you can see here on the wind, the photography was from here to the, to, in the opposite way, uh, was decided by the community where we put uh, in a discussion disadvantages, advantages of each place. And finally, we decide this place. And that was at the end also what we developed. Again, here with the Eastern Island, how you promote this dialogue uh, based on, on this communication or boundary object, this scale model uh, of the island. Another issue in the Eastern Island is the um, use of, the, um, of the, the land use because of all the anthropological or archeological objects that you, findings that you have in, in, the, in the island, you can taste nothing. And the way we, we discuss this with, was with projections of different layers where we tried to start a conversation on where we really are able to do that. We are very happy because last week, after so, so many years, finally it was approved a first three megawatt PV plant for the island in the place that was part of the results we developed two years ago with the, with the study in the um, in the in, in the airport uh, is the best location to do that and uh, we expect to be to see that as a reality very soon here you can see the way is the same the same object and with different projections you can combine uh, areas where you you have high radiation of solar energy because of the angle areas where you have good wind and areas that are protected because of archaeological issues. This is the way we can uh, uh, define uh, this. And for that, what we use um, in a formal way is a planning um, tool for optimal design of this type of solutions. And we can combine this based on the input parameters that are in, in in, as a result of this diagnostic phase. So we move forward to the design based on the previous analysis. And there is some experience where you can uh, explore uh, different, different types of solutions, as you can see here. And you can, you know, for example, divide the solutions for showing the total capital costs and the total monthly fuel cost, also capex, opex, if you want. And based on that, uh, you will see uh, many solutions. Some of the solutions are dominated by others, but there are some specific solutions that are very interesting. For example, the um, uh, this disposal, yes, you can say, to, to for the community to pay every month uh, um, a quota for, for the system can be limited like this. So you can see only the solutions under this level uh, can be accepted. On, in capital costs, you can say only the solutions below 100 million pesos or something like that can be uh, taken into account because we don't have the, the support for more money. So you can start to explore good solutions that are uh, based on different constraints discussed by the community. This was a very nice um, study that we applied to different projects, for example, to the Guatacondo, a community and we arrive to this type of design. At the end, we were not able to supply 100% um, renewal energy solution. We arrived to a solution that needs to combine a diesel generator. Uh, and at the end, the penetration at that time was 50-50 more or less, 50% uh, renewals and 50% uh, with a diesel generation uh, to, to complete the energy supply. And, and of course, you need to start to define solutions like SCADA system, supervisory control, and data acquisition in a, in a very interesting flavor. At that time, we create the concept of social SCADA, trying to develop a SCADA uh, that is not only technical, but also connected with the responsible. He's the 
um, the person in the town uh, that is in charge of the uh, the operation of the system um, and he's able to manage this and based on on a training this part of the um, transfer of of the solutions here more detailed information about the final solution we implemented in 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 Watacondo. Um, here are some measurements about the the different um, um, operation conditions during the day. This is part of the scala. So you can see this is the load in the system in green, uh, in red at this time, at this uh, in 2014, uh, the, uh, July 11. Uh, and here is the solar production, some clouds uh, in the evening. And here in blue, you can see the management of the battery system. If you go negative, it's because you are charging. If you go positive, if you are um, using the battery to supply. And at the end of the day, as mentioned before, you need to use the diesel generation, uh, the gen set, to both to supply the demand and also to reload or recharge the battery so you can start the next day. Uh, here you can see us the next day. And, and to to make the overall cycle based on a rational behavior. And this is it needs to be an automatic way. This is also a technical here uh, to show the, um, the impact of following or not following uh, with the tracking system. This is the natural curve without following. And if you go, this is a three-phase system. With following, you gain around 20%, 30% uh, more energy, which implies a 4% um, improve in the capacity uh, factor of the plant. This is part of the design learning from our side. We tried to put a um, wind uh, solution at that time, but what a condo means, the condor beard area, this is a translation, a uh, location of condors, and at that time, based on local discussions, we need to develop uh, this additional cage for the wind system to avoid the crash of a condor bird with the, with the installation. And this was unexpected. It, the, the, the impact of that was six months delay in, in the implementation. It's only to show you that when you go really in, in these real projects, uh, you will face some surprises. And this is the importance of this co-construction approach to minimize, not to eliminate, but to minimize these um, ideas. But um, in the context of Watacondo, we also um, push, this is Professor Patricio, Wata, uh, Patricio Mendoza from our group, the recycling of equipment and the idea was at that time uh, if you need to move with energy in low voltage to 220 volts more than 500 meters then you will face very high losses in the system and the way you can avoid this is to use small transformers and the recycling of microwave transformers which have a ratio of one to ten um, is a, a feasible solution to do this and we make some experiments doing the, these local solutions to avoid these high losses here uh, and to improve the efficiency in rural areas where you don't have like in Watacondo that you are uh, all concentrated in one area which is very good from that point of view but in the case of Watacondo the, the wind turbine was around near one kilometer far away so the way to avoid losses was to use these transformers to go in situ 20, 220 volts to 2000 volts. And in that way, you can uh, um, reduce an important number around 50 times, 100 times the losses in the system. Um, of course, in stage four, you need to develop these sustainability indicators uh, um, to discuss the energy rates and the payment from the community. It's always a very complex issue because um, the dependency of, of these subsidies from in Chile based on the, on the support of the local government or the companies makes it very difficult to, to create these tariffs uh, in these local structures. But it's part of the challenge and perhaps it's a discussion from the today's seminar. Here, a quick view of about the social scala. Um, we try to introduce innovative ideas. Um, the, these are not already in place 
but uh, we, we believe it can be good solutions. It's like a traffic lamp uh, with green, yellow, and red. And the idea is the time you are now, for example, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and you show for the next uh, 24 hours uh, the suggestions, uh, how the people uh, will use the energy based on the, uh, on the weather forecast and so on. And they say, when it is red, try to avoid the use of energy. Uh, if it is uh, um, yellow, business as usual. And if it is green, uh, please try to use the energy in these slots. That was the idea of this, of this uh, solution. Again, you can show in this social scala the, the behavior, a, a better figure as before. You can see here the storage. Yeah, the load, the diesel generation, um, and, and the solar, the beautiful sun of the Chilean north. Yeah, all the training work in Guatacondo. We also try to develop a, a v, EV. It's, um, we, we are trying to finish this project. It's an electrical vehicle for special applications in, in rural areas. And the idea is electrical vehicles can make also use of the solar solution. So they don't, in that way, you avoid the importation of fuels from outside the town and you are more independent. In the case, Watacondo, when you have the rains in the Altiplano every year, eh, it's not, eh, or it's quite often that they need to close the, the, the way to Watacondo and they are isolated and this type of solutions are able to work with electromobility and are very robust. So for that, it was a nice challenge. This is the final product is still in our labs. And we try to see um, how we can finish this, some power electronics solutions that we implement for that. Um, we have nine minutes uh, to, to finish. And uh, now uh, I, I gave you some details about, um, about the, the situation in Watacondo. And I will move forward um, with, um, with some very quick overview of other works that uh, we, we developed during this time. Um, this is the difference in the co-constructions, the traditional approach compared with co-construction. I want to highlight the design is developed normally in, by the technical team in the, in the traditional solutions. And in the case of co-constructions, you need to do it jointly between the technical team and the community. Of course, if you go and say, okay, you don't have too much time to do that. This is a learning process. In, in our opinion, of course, the first projects are very expensive and are very time consuming. But year by year, the idea is yeah, that the learning process and if you disseminate these results, at the end, it needs to be part of the culture. And then it will be faster. And this is the way you can um, remove barriers for the market development in this area. This is our understanding at the end. Um, let me be very fast, only to give you a quick overview. We, of course, try to use all the planning tools that are available as commercial products, and we develop also some own um, tools uh, looking for the different um, stages, pre-feasibility, design, basic engineering. And as you see, uh, this is the typical approach follow uh, in the case of NREL. Um, this is the steps, only to give you an overview. Uh, you have also from Enrel a more basic. We are quite aligned with, with the ideas behind this, but there are different flavors and different scopes of the different developments. You also know Red Screen, Hoga, Lab, and, and their camp. So uh, today um, there are free available and not free available, but um, many options to, to move forward. The more, one of the most, um, Popular are Homer solution for the design, uh, and and this is part also. And trans, uh, Transis is also a tool that we use for that. Uh, you can see the approach from Epri. Uh, at the end, you can combine this. You can explore solutions. And I want let me skip this. Uh, this is a solution that we plan for Romeral. It's another microgrid, not too far away uh, compared with Watacondo but we try to put a step-by-step -step development and 
uh, for 39 houses and four buildings. Um, that was the solution arrived with a combination of the using of Homer, but also with local simulation tools developed. And so we define different stages. Um, at the end, the, the project stopped at the stage one because the, the main power grid arrives to the place and, and so all the people forgot. And we see that in a big contradiction. Normally what we observe is like the options are two. I, I arrive with the central power grid or I develop an isolated uh, microgrid. In the case of Eastern Island, no way <laughs> you need to do that. But in many places in Chile, um, we really believe that this is a, a false dilemma because what we need to solve uh, mostly is both the best use of the local resources combined with the support of the power grid, perhaps exportation, importation. And this understanding is in the case of Chile at the beginning phase, and we hope to change this for the future. Um, so again, we explore different solutions, and this is the minimum present value, uh, mean OPEX, mean CAPEX, uh, mean replacement cost. So if you ask the people, for example, uh, one of the main issues is if, if how you can collect money for the replacement costs of the new equipment. And perhaps the best solution is a solution that is not too good in operation, but uh, you are able to, to, to have the lower replacement cost, which is very good for the community because it's a good solution to, for, for the, how they collect this money. So I am arriving to the end of the presentation. There are some additional slides. Let me go only to, to show you uh, the discussions in the island based on this. Um, we, you are not able to show a Homer matrix with the community, not because the people are not able to understand. It's because they want to see the problem converted in a problem that makes sense for the local community. And finally, we arrive um, to, with, the, with the Eastern Island in this picture. They want to see the total cost. They want to see, understand the co-impacts like the traffic. So red is high co-impacts, green is low. Behind this is a big narrative before that, reliability issues, if you move average cost, land use, install capacity of the different technologies, uh, energy production of the system and emissions for CO2 and the pictures that show you the result. And we explore with the people from the Eastern Island, if you make nothing, this will be the evolution. And we put a, in comparison with the business as usual, different scenarios with 30% of a renewal scenario penetration. And we show, okay, you need more, more land. And, okay. And, so I am quite near to the end. And finally, we, you are able to explore in, in real active workshops uh, and to discuss what is the best one. At the end, today with the decision of this uh, new PV plant, they will move in, in that way perhaps, mm? uh, around 80% of renewal penetration between this and this. And so we expect that this can be a good, good manner to, to, to push this. So I want to finish here, so to, to see with this slide the different futures that we are facing. Again, we are not against the centralized solution uh, because they will uh, give support for the overall system, but we really expect uh, for the future the combination of local solutions, isolated or connected with centralized solutions, and we see this is a bright future for Latin America um, in, I hope, in the near future. So thank you very much for your attention. Right, uh, Rodrigo, thank you very much for, for your presentation uh, and all, all the information there. Um, can I just encourage the audience to, to type questions into chat? We'll either deal with those now or, uh, or, or uh, Rodrigo will deal with them um, uh, using the chat function. Um, there's, there's a question for, from Yuan. Um, Jose, uh, about the optimum tool and whether this makes uh, a unit commitment problem. Um, is that something you want to comment on or is it best? Yes. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, perhaps I can, there are some additional slides. Um, we develop a unit commitment with colleagues uh, that are also present here in the, in the, in the presentation here available. Um, and let me show you um, one slide here. But this is an issue, and you need to develop more than a unit commitment itself. What we need to develop is, um, is what we call an energy management system. And in the field of energy management system, uh, I don't find here directly the, the slide I want to show you. Uh, yes, here. You are not sharing the screen, Rodrigo. Yes, now I will, I will share that. Um, I hope it's not too slow. Yes. This was our first paper in that regard, uh, an EMS approach. For that, uh, we call it a microgrid energy management system based on the rolling horizon strategy. Um, you will find a lot of solutions with stochastic unit commitment or not. Um, we, our approach, this is a well-cited paper, uh, is, is based on, of course, you can say it's a unit commitment, but we, it's more an energy management system, very close adapted to Wataconda. And, and at the end, you have wind generation models, electric and uh, load for forecasting with um, persistence models or, or some more sophisticated approach, some water consumption because we manage a pump, photovoltaic generation model, and you have a, a weather forecast with the system and with an, a, an optimization problem that can be developed for with own researchers or you can use some of the um, available in, in commercial solutions, you are able to define the, um, the operation uh, on off for all the, the next periods. In the case of what I want to use, you observe that we have three times periods. Solar energy is the, the master and the best will manage frequency and voltage in the system for the whole day where we have sun. In the evening, you change that because you convert the diesel generator in the master and you need to have an approach to manage frequency control based on the diesel generator. And so the best is more follower and try to recharge the batteries. And so you define the, the states and this is part of the understanding that, of course, only to, to give you, the, it's a very important area of development and in our opinion, um, uh, there is a big space to make local developments for that. Okay, uh, th thank you very much uh, for that explanation. Uh, and thank you very much for your talk, uh, Rodrigo. It's uh, great to hear about all those things. Um, I think I've got lots of questions, but I think we'll move on to the next presenter in the interest of time. Uh, but can I just repeat, if people have additional questions, if you put them in the chat and we will, can deal with them uh, in, in that way. Um, our next speaker um, is speaking about microgrids in isolated communities uh, in Paraguay. Uh, and this is uh, Raquel um, Futter. Uh, Raquel leads um, the area initiatives for the new economy um, of Fundacion uh, Moses uh, Betoni, um, which is an NGO in Paraguay dedicated to nature conservation and sustainability. Uh, she focuses on the design and implementation of uh, innovative projects uh, ranging from renewable energy to STEM in education and young women's empowerment and initiatives that focus on economical, uh, social and environmental values. So she works very closely with the private sector as well as international organisations such as the World Bank um, in these areas. So, uh, Raquel, if I could hand over to you, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for your presentation as well. And I don't know if you can see my screen or not. It's just coming. Yes, we can see your screen now. Excellent. Okay, so thank you once again uh, to uh, Marco for the invitation. It's great to be here. I enjoy your presentation, Rodrigo, very much, which set the tone for, for this presentation as well. 
Um, I would like to also take the opportunity to say hi to my very good friend in Guatemala, um, Livia, who I uh, had the chance to uh, meet her in the past. So let's start. Um, this morning, uh, I'm going to talk about the micro grids for isolated communities in Paraguay. I'm going to talk about two cases. One of them is the case of El Solitario, and the second case is about Baracayú. So let's go to El Solitario. El Solitario in Spanish means the solitary, which means it's very easy to understand that we're talking about an isolated community. And this community is located in the Chaco Paraguayo here, this region of Paraguay. And uh, El Solitario is located here in the department of Boquerón, in the district of Mariscal Estigarribia, 720 kilometers from Asunción. Now, let's put in context El Chaco. El Chaco is a very um, isolated region. It represents 60% of the national territory, nevertheless, less than 5% of the population live in this region. And it should be mentioned that the Chaco it has very extreme weather conditions. It's very hot or it's very cold and it's very dusty. Here, uh, this is a picture of the community that was taken um, and you can clearly see the, the, the dust in the region. And here is El Solitario. A boarding is a small rural community with a boarding school serving 45 students from different ages, from 6 to 15. And El Solitario share a common problem to many isolated community, which is the lack of access to sustainable energy. And we know that this is a problem in many areas, also in the Chaco. So um, to just give you a little sense of the work that we conducted here in this region, I want to see if we can play the video and I'm going to apologize in advance because it's only in Spanish. But just please bear with me and we'll see if we can uh, play the video. because I think it will set the tone for the conversation. Maybe not. No, we cannot play the video. Well, no problem. Let me just tell you about this story. This story takes place in 2015, when Fundación Moisés Bertoni, the NGO that I work uh, for um, dedicated to sustainable, co to conservation and sustainable development, um, work in uh, side to side with this company called Impaco to uh, present a solution to El Solitario with a campaign that was later uh, called La Luz del Solitario. And now I just want to point out that this company. Uh, this national company, Impaco, had a slogan. And the slogan of the company is, we drive energy to the country. Of course, this is a private company um, that had a very clear uh, objective, uh, which is, was also to uh, go beyond um, places where they can take the electricity. So. They, they came to us and, and asked us if we, we knew about a community that was in need for a sustainable solution in energy. And this is how we partnered with them. And La Luz del Solitario was born, this campaign. So the campaign was to um, provide the solution of installing the, uh, the solar panels to this community which is, you know, located far from, from the capital. Um, the project installed these 12 solar panels with a capacity of three uh, 
thousand watts to provide the energy provision for the school. And what is interesting about this project that I want to mention in correlation to uh, what Rodrigo said previously is the importance in creating teams, is the importance in also understanding um, the territory and building uh, teams with the community. And one of the greatest lessons uh, from El Solitario was exactly that, the community building and the joint efforts. So we just didn't uh, brought the solution uh, with the installation of the solar panels. There was a huge community effort uh, to not only provide them with the access to energy with the solar panels, but also uh, to, to help them to improve what they have there at the school. Like for example, uh, they participate in, in the building efforts to uh, have the school cleaner and paint the school. Uh, we clean with them. Uh, the children participate in all the activities. And it was not only about uh, this, this, the installation of the solar panels, but also was a very close relationship developed with the people from the company, from the Impaco company and their employees that they conduced this huge um, campaign to collect uh, also um, books and, and, and utensils for, for, the, for the classroom. Uh, so this was a very uh, integrated solution for El Solitario. And uh, as I mentioned, one of the greatest lessons that we learned from El Solitario is that together we are a multiplying force for good. Now, um, as I go to another part of the country, to a forest, I want to talk about the Embaracayú Forest Nature Reserve which is the last remnant of continued forest in Paraguay. And where is this forest? This forest is in the department of Canindeyú, in the area of Villa Icatimi. In 2000, this area surrounded the reserve was declared a biosphere reserve by the UNESCO in 2000. And what is important to mention that uh, when we talk about the last remnant of primary forces, we can see that in the last decades, 90% of the forest has disappeared. And now only 7% of the original cover is present. Now, what is important to understand is that this little um, forest uh, that is left represents two important um, ecosystems. One of them is the Atlantic forest, and the other one is the Cerrado. These two ecosystems are highly important for world conservation. And what is amazing about this forest, it's, uh, well, one, of, one, one reason is that it's, uh, it's the continued forest. It's a primary forest that has 64,407 hectares. This is a forest where there is a great biodiversity. Here we find uh, all kinds of mammals, birds, and endangered species such as the jaguar and the tapir. And Baracayú is also a very special place because it has culture and a rich heritage. This is the place uh, of the ancestral home of the Ache indigenous community. And they are the only ones until today who can hunt within the reserve with their traditional weapons. So inside this beautiful forest in this part of the region, uh, we have a school, a boarding school just like the previous one that we've seen in the Chaco. And this boarding school 
it's it's a boarding school for young rural and indigenous girls. The school was established with the mission to empower rural and indigenous girls to become agents of sustainability, uh, excuse me, to become the agents of change and sustainable develop, development leaders. This is a school uh, that focuses on different aspects. One of them, it focuses on environmental education, entrepreneurship, sustainability, and learning by doing model. This is a school uh, that also focuses on, on a self-sustained model school, which means that it's the education that it pays for itself. This school has two different business units. One of them is the Embarakayu Lodge, and the other one is Embarakayu Products. The Embarakayu Lodge it's, it's a lodge where tourists can go and stay while they also contribute to the education of these girls. And the second one is Embarakayu Product, which is a, a natural line that focuses on, on the production and of products like honey and, and spices and where the students also actively um, are involved in, in the process. Here we can see how they are um, placing the honey inside the jars in order to, to be sold into the market. Now, when we ask the question, why girls? Uh, why establishing a school only for girls, only for rural and indigenous girls? And the answer comes when we understand the region, when we understand the territory. And this territory, the illiteracy rate among women is enormously high. And 90% of all girls, they become pregnant at the age of 14 and later they drop out of school. And this is an area where more than 80% of the region population live in extreme poverty. And also it is well known that establishing a school for girls was necessary or it is necessary because we know that in rural areas girls tend to have less access to quality education for different reasons. So now, so now we know that when we start investing in girls' education, uh, the community flourishes since women tend to invest more in their children and it's, it works as a multiplier effect when we, when we start closing the gender gap. So what Baracayu and El Solitario have in common? And obviously is that they are both located in very distant areas, rural areas, and with the phenomenon that they don't have access to constant access to sustainable energy. And here comes the second part of this presentation that uh, place the students in the middle of the action. So in 2018, the school won the Syed Sustainability Prize which allowed the school to implement a project focusing on renewable energy and energy efficiency, sustainability, and community building. Now, I'm going to focus on the solar energy aspect of, of the project, which, um, which focuses on the installation of the hybrid photovoltaic technology to produce both electricity and hot water for the school. And this is the, the, the solar panels that were installed in the, in, in the school. Uh, they were imported from the Netherlands. And we see here that they're not very common solar panels. They are curved, they have a mirror, and they produce both electricity and hot water. Each of them have um, capacity to produce uh, 2 and 70 watt, uh, watts for electricity and, and a maximum uh, water peak for thermal energy of 1,250. 
The, these uh, collectors were installed in three independent systems. One of them was the kitchen, one of them was the dorm, and one of them was the classroom. And uh, I should mention that this is a boarding school for girls, which means that they live and they study at the Embaracayu Educational Center. Now, um, all these 20 power collectors uh, have the capacity to produce 25,500 kilowatts uh, for hot water and 4,800 kilowatts uh, for electricity. Now, what are the lessons from Baracayu? One of them is the power and in integrating and empowering the girls. And this is exactly what uh, Rodrigo was also mentioning previously in his uh, presentation. Uh, the importance of integrating social components and not only focusing on going into a community to install uh, solar panels. And what I want to focus here is that when we integrate and we uh, empower girls, and we give them to access to quality education, we do not only change their life, but we also change their communities and the generations to come. And another lesson that we have learned is that when we empower uh, young girls and indigenous girls to become the agents of change, we need to inspire them so they can inspire. And something really nice about this project is that they conduct a puppetry show based on, on different aspects of the sustainability of the school, including uh, the, sol the installation of the solar panels. So in the puppetry show, uh, they talk about all these different uh, components of the school focusing on sustainability through a puppetry show where they have reached all six different schools that are surrounding the Embaracayu Reserve, reaching 700 children. Now, um, this year, uh, there are two more schools that will, um, that will be reached with the puppetry show. Now, the puppetry show is based, as I mentioned before, in all the activities that are conducted at the Centro Educativo Maracayu, which is um, displayed in this beautiful book called Aventuras Sustentables in Maracayu, Sustainable Adventures in Maracayu, uh, where we do not only talk about solar energy, but we talk about also gravity light, uh, how we can also produce biogas, and how we can also protect our forest. So I'm going to be just uh, really brief with this presentation as well, but I want to focus <coughs> on the following. And one of the main lessons that we have learned uh, from the experience in Imbaracayu is that when we offer uh, young girls and indigenous girls access to quality education and when we have a safe environment where they can thrive and learn new skills and practice sustainability, we actually contribute to a positive change in their families, in their communities, thereby ensuring uh, the survival of the Baracayu forest, our last forest. So, uh, on a final on a final word, I just want to mention this. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember and involve me and I will learn. And this is uh, by Benjamin Franklin. And uh, this for me personally, this uh, has been one of the greatest lessons of working with rural communities, trying to uh, install a new technology, trying to get them um, not only learn, not only teaching them how to use it, but also involving them. 
And when we do this, when we involve them, when we co-create with them and when we make them part of the project, the, the, the project it, it is successful. And so I just want to uh, finish with that quote and, and thank you all for your time. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that I couldn't um, play the video. Let's see if we can fix that later. But just in honor of the time, um, I just want to thank you for, for your time. And you can reach me at any time. Uh, this is my email address. And I encourage you all to uh, go also to the website of Fundación Moisés Bertoni and learn all the things that we are doing. So thank you very much for your time. Wow. Um, thank you very much for that uh, in inspiring presentation. Um, I, I believe we'll be able to put the video uh, up on the, the YouTube page uh, associated with the event, the event as well. So it will be accessible there. Um, can I pose the audience, if you, if you have questions, please, please put up your hand or um, type the question uh, into the, the text. Um, there's comments coming through about about uh, about the excellent presentation. And um, one question to start with: um, you, you're describing the installation um, and 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 the great engagement you've got. What measures have you put in place to ensure that the system is maintained going forward into the future? Well, um, we're talking about two communities here. One of them is in the Chaco. Uh, which is the, the case of El Solitario. And I want to start answering with El Solitario. And, and what it was so important for the Solitario was also the perspective of the company Impaco. Impaco was, uh, is a company that, wa that was very clear at the very beginning who will maintain the system. We need to find a community that is engaged that a community that at the beginning will have um, the collaboration with the foundation and in, in a community that can have the support or the presence of someone who will work with him. And that was key uh, for the sustainability of the system. Because at the beginning, the, the company wanted, okay, we want to bring energy to a community. But we know that this community uh, needs to have the needs to have the team, which is uh, what uh, Rodrigo was also mentioning. It's so important to build team from day one, and and that helped the system to be sustained throughout the different throughout the years. Remember, we installed this system in back in two thousand and fifteen. And although today one, one of the two panels are not longer working, the community developed these, um, these skills also uh, to, to reach to others. And because of the, the, the activity was not only focusing on the installation of the system, but also on the building of community and, and, and pointing out how important is the role that each single person plays out from the children, from the director of the school, from the people managing the boarding school. So it is an integral part of what makes a system to be sustainable. <coughs> so I hope that answers to your question. Your microphone. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I've got another question that, that, that's come in, um, which is, uh, have these ideas been implemented in other areas in South America uh, that you're aware of, or, or just in Paraguay? The idea of how to manage a forest, or the idea of installing a PV system? Well, the, the way you install PV systems and work with the communities, has that been put into different 
is that something you've shared with other countries in South America yet, or is that? Well, uh, we uh, let, let me just answer from the point of view from Baracayú now, from the experience of Baracayú. We installed this project, we started the installation in 2019. And, and these are the first hydro power collectors installed in the country. No, let me just correct that. These are the first hybrid collectors installed in South America. And you know that with innovation and that something that is so new, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, so we are, I, I love that Rodrigo said that this is a learning process because it truly is for us uh, being in the middle of the forest. It has been truly a learning process, starting with how to do the importation of the collectors, how to work with a local team to do the installation and how to transfer the knowledge to the, to, to the community, to the school, which is still a learning process for us. Uh, but yes, we are very happy that these um, collectors, they produce both uh, electricity and hot water. And we still uh, have a lot of, uh, this, the journey is still uh, ahead for us to learn how to manage uh, well as well. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, the final question I have is, do you link in with any of the international organizations? Uh, I mean, how do you link in with things like the, the World Bank, for example, um, or on the technical side with things like the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers? Uh, I noticed there's a comment literally just come up as I said that um, about <laughs> members of the um, Institute of Electrical Electronic Engineers, uh, Industrial Electronics. Well be my guest i i love this space because it opens an invitation for people to come and take a look at the system and learn from it and learn with us uh so currently um yes we we, we import the, the the collectors from the netherlands from from a company focusing also on innovation uh, but yes, uh, we would love also to, to open the door for collaboration with other organizations and, and, and key people who are interested more about the system, learning and, and also collaborating uh, with us. Okay, that, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you for answering all the questions. Um, next on the agenda is a short break um, until... 10.40 Chilean time, so that's uh, seven minutes from now um, for, for, for those of us who are in various different parts of the world. We, we will leave the systems open so you can stay uh, online and we'll leave the microphones open so if people want to ask um, either of our first two speakers questions or, or enter into general conversation, uh, please do so uh, either using the microphones or with the, with the chat function. Um, and we'll we'll start formally back in seven minutes time and we'll try and keep to time but thank you ever so much for your presentation and, and all the inspiration and ideas it's, that's been great Raquel. thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much Raquel, for your presentation <clears throat> um, in the meanwhile uh, during the break i would like to know uh, about our attendees uh, from which country they are coming from uh, I'm Marco Rivera from Chile, uh, Raquel is from Paraguay, but Will is from England, but I don't know if uh, some of you can open the microphone and tell us from where are you coming. Yeah, Marco, I am Chile. I'm Maria Ines Bala from Argentina, you know, from National University of La Plata, and well, we are, I am very glad with this program. You have started last year, and especially now I, I like to congratulate uh, Raquel. For, it, it sounds it's really a great job they have done in Paraguay uh, with these people, not only installing uh, renewable energy, but also uh, teaching and empowering uh, girls to develop uh, in the forest. Great. Thank you very much, Marianas.
I'm Pablo Cosuta from Technological Institute of Buenos Aires. I work closely in relate with Marina Espala. And <clears throat> I'd like to thank Raquel again because it's amazing what you have done in Paraguay. Uh, I know the difficult that is to grow up a project like this in Paraguay as it's similar in Argentina. And it's a great job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and of course, this is this is the work of so many people uh, involved in, in, in the passion that it comes with uh, many of the leaders um, also working with the students, uh, the, the director, the teachers, uh, the entire staff, uh, which most of them have been in the organization uh, since its uh, very conception back in uh, 1988. Good morning, I'm Mariana Rojas from the University of Nottingham, Chile, and I'm currently in Viña del Mar, Chile. And well, I just wanted to point it that um, it's very important what you have been doing in Paraguay. I was very impressed with the presentation of Raquel. That was amazing. And also the fact of you working, especially with girls, that is a very empowering thing. And it's very important because it is very uh, special, the um, you know, input that the, it's there since the poverty in, in the rural areas is especially harsh on, on, on women. And the fact that you're actually empowering the women there, that's really, really awesome. I, I really congratulate you and your team for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And just living in rural areas for a girl is hard. And, and the reality is that you, we, you can understand till you leave it there you know, the discrimination, uh, the violence against women as well. And, and also that sense that you're not enough because you're a girl, that you cannot install solar panels because you're just a girl, or that why you want to be an engineer and you're just a girl. So this changing in, in, in behavior, this changing in the way of thinking, uh, that women, they do have the capacity to reach for the stars, uh, to create a great impact in society. It's very important and, and it's only possible through access to education and to access to quality education and, and also working with the community to change the chip in how they see us as women. And, and, and that has been a truly learning uh, journey, not, not only for, this, for the girls, but also personally for me, <clears throat> um, which uh, it's it, at the end of the day, it's like why you do what you do, uh, why you work on the projects that you do. And, and it's truly, when, when I mentioned the importance to inspire in order to, ins to later, ins so the girls can also inspire. And, and the, I think that's the key. Yes, we do the installation of the panels. Yes, it has a technical aspect, which is not easy, but it's a learning process. And that's something that we need to also understand. And, and, and I really love what, 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 what Patricio uh, uh, said at the beginning of the presentation. It's all about creating that social um, web that is necessary for a project and for a person to thrive. Thank you very much, Mariana and Raquel, for your comments. Come on. Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Raquel. I am from Montreal, Canada. My name is Kamal Al Haddad. I'm, uh, a colleague of uh, Maria, Dr. Maria Valla from uh, Argentina. Uh, I'm very much impressed by uh, and attracted by your project. Indeed, I was uh, president of IEEE Society, and I, I am aware that we can support these kind of initiatives uh, 
from the scientific society and we can give you some support, but we need to have from you some local people who are probably close to our organization membership or whatever, or university professors that we can uh, give you a lot of support, uh, but to have it, do you have to, we have to apply for a, the grant and uh, it, it is, it is uh, it's not very complicated. So you can have a lot of support from IEEE IES, I'm sure Maria will help me as well and I can support the project and many of us uh, can support uh, the project. So congratulations to you for your hard work. I'm really very much impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Shokran. <laughs> Right. Uh, at that point, um, I'm going to thank uh, Raquel and, and everyone for, for, for that uh, for that conversation. Um, but I am going to sadly draw it to a close. I know we could go on for a long time, uh, but uh, I, I, I think we, we should we should really move on to, to the next speaker. Uh, and um, but uh, again, I'd just like to thank Raquel for that fantastic presentation uh, and, and everyone for the discussion that we've had. So thank you very much. Um, I'll introduce the next speaker, who is uh, uh, Carlos uh, uh, Munoz from uh, the uh, Universidad de Fontera in Chile. Uh, and he is going to be speaking about energy and water management systems for agro uh, development in rural communities. Um, uh, Carlos received his electronic engineering degree from the Universidad de la Fontera in Temuco, Chile in 1990, and his uh, PhD from the Catolica in Santiago in 2000 uh, in engineering sciences and industrial automation. Um, he joined the Universidad de Frontera in um, 1996 and he is currently uh, an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering. Carlos, uh, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Can I share the screen? Uh, okay. Well. Yeah, yeah that's what we've, you've shared your screen. Yeah. Uh, are you screen. seeing that, right? That's perfect, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry, I, I didn't know if I shared the screen with sound. I need the sound. Okay. Uh, well, I am Carlos Muñoz from the University of La Frontera, uh, and I, I want to tell you uh, our work of about uh, 20 years. Uh, we, what we uh, started with uh, Professor Doris Saez Wei Japan. She made the degree with, uh, with me in the university, in the Catholic University. Uh, she is working in the University of Chile. Actually, she is a titular professor in the University of Chile. Uh, and a lot of other people, uh, I was, well, at the end, I, I will present every, every one of them with the respective photograph. And in my university, my partner is Juan Ignacio Urcan. And, uh, well, there is other uh, students and people that are, uh, have been working with us in along the years. Well, what is our motivation uh, to work with the Mapuche people? Mapuche people is in our zone, in the, in the, in the, in the Araucanía region, is in the south of Chile. Uh, it is a very beautiful land. Uh, we have a well, mountains and coast, uh, but uh, they are origin people, just like in the previous presentation, they, they have a lot of problem with the impact of our, so, uh, our, our society. For example, the families in, in, in this, uh, in the, is being disintegrated by because of the migration of the young people to the big cities. Uh, Temuco is one big city for them, but also a lot of people go to Santiago. Uh, and the rural communities are, well, 
uh, they 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 still be, but there is a lot of very old people and very young children, but the young people is not in there. So how they uh, how 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 can we make um, the people the the life of that people uh, better? Mapuche means people of the land. Uh, Mapu is land and Che means people. So uh, that is in Mapudungun. Mapudungun is a language of the people. Uh, we have a very big gap that is, it has even political implication and uh, violence and a lot of uh, things. But the, the core issue is the loss or well, the, the gap between the cultural view of the of the life between them and, and us. Uh, the Mapuche culture has a, a strong respect for the environment and his renewable uh, resources. For example, they 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 don't uh, do monoculture uh, on the land because they have a strong impact on the land. Uh, but our society uh, promotes uh, big areas of land cultivated with one type of uh, of seed. Uh, the implementation of microgrid uh, for energy supplies uh, makes some think of like an autonomy of the energy, not only the autonomy in. in in political way, but the autonomy of energy supply, that is a, a very a good motivation. But uh, for us, the the, the the motivation was that in the in the land that is covered by the community, uh, they are very uh, far away with the uh, the center of uh, of people. So for the uh, enterprises that cover the electricity is not a very big, uh, good business to to supply with the energy with that. Uh, they When they have a problem with the, uh, the, the, the supply of energy, for example, uh, post is far away because of of the storms or something like that. The, the company, the energy company, uh, well, delay the, the repair by about two, three days. And well, if they have, for example, a meat stored in, in freezers, they, they, they cannot use that. So uh, for them, it's not a, an issue to have a container for freeze meat or freeze something because they have a no reliable energy. Uh, the smart. Uh, concept, the, the smart farm concept. Uh, uh, we, we try to put the concept of a smart farm, smart in the sense of sustainable, manageable, and accessible rural technology for two of the problems that we see, but what they are irrigation of water and livestock monitoring system. Uh, well, we propose that and we propose to work in two community. One is, this one is very beautiful. They have uh, this is in the coast. They has uh, some beach. Uh, they they are uh, 100 kilometers of Temuco. Temuco is the big city in the area. Uh, they name themselves Las Lafkenche people. Uh, uh, Lafken is uh, where well, the sea of great source of water. Uh, che, and che is people. Uh, they have no mobile phone or internet coverage. They have uh, f uh, five, uh, well, five uh, almost 300 hectares, but they are mostly mountains, some um, streams of water that go to the, uh, to the sea. Their main productive activities are agriculture for their own consumption. They, they, they not produce to sell more of them small livestock, uh, but, but uh, not only, well, in, in small quantity, uh, collecting seaweed sea and seafood for, for selling. They are connected to 
an unreliable grid with high frequency of faults. Uh, I, I want to show a short video. It's subtitled. It's in Spanish, but it's, uh, it is subtitled. A 11 kilómetros de Nueva Imperial, región de la Araucanía, se encuentra la comunidad mapuche Guanaco Huenchun. Uno de los principales problemas que afecta a esta comunidad, integrada por 116 habitantes, son los cortes no programados y el alto costo de la electricidad. Pero esta situación no afecta solo a las 83 familias de Guanaco Huenchun. Otra de las comunidades afectadas es José Painecura, de Mapuche Slavkenche, ubicada a 45 kilómetros de Caragüe. Cuando recién llegó la luz acá, nosotros estábamos todos muy contentos porque era, era, era la luz, era, era un avance para, la, para todo el sector. Pero a, a medida que ha ido pasando el tiempo, nos hemos ido dado cuen, dando cuenta que, que eh, no utilizaron prácticamente, porque nunca no, se nos preguntó a nosotros si, teníamos, si queríamos eh, la luz, dónde iban a instalar los postes. Nosotros tenemos muy poca tierra como comunidad, y, y a eso ahora los, los postes están todos ubicados dentro donde nosotros sembramos. Cuando llega la, el cobro de la luz, de repente chuta, gente que me llegó salado. Yo más, nosotros acá estamos pagando sobre, sobre 40 mil pesos, 43, 44 mil pesos, imagínense. Es con estas dos comunidades que un equipo de la Universidad de Chile y de la Universidad de la Frontera está implementando el proyecto Diseño e Implementación de un Prototipo Experimental de Microredes para Comunidades Mapuche, encabezado por la académica del Departamento de Ingeniería Eléctrica, Doris Saez. Tenemos un equipo interdisciplinario, antropólogos, ingenieros, eh, estudiantes, académicos, eh, es un trabajo en terreno en realidad con la comunidad y aprendiendo la comunidad. Queremos plantear soluciones de cómo utilizar la energía con ellos ¿ya? para el desarrollo productivo. Y el desarrollo productivo está alineado a la cultura. No vamos a ir a hacer desarrollo productivo que no esté alineado con sus propios requerimientos. La idea es aprovechar la generación de energía en localidades aisladas, utilizando medios renovables, eh, para eh, hacer más fácil el trabajo dentro de las comunidades rurales, sobre todo las comunidades indígenas. Es un proyecto positivo porque se está haciendo el estudio antes de ingresar con el proyecto. Y eso es bueno, porque si yo traigo un proyecto y no sé cómo hacerlo o lo traigo sin saber si va a funcionar o no, eh, nuestra comunidad se comienzan a dividirse. ¿Por qué? Porque no se está haciendo bien las cosas. Yo creo que esto es una buen, buena idea y un buen pronóstico para dentro de la comunidad de, la, de José Paine y Cura. Realmente yo estuve conversando con otras comunidades que también están interesadas en estos proyectos. Aún todavía no lo han visto trabajar, pero una vez que esté funcionando, yo creo que esto va a ser bastante bueno para las otras comunidades. Porque, porque uno lo entiende, ellos no entienden, ellos tienen tiempo, se dan el tiempo para estar, para hacer las cosas. Hacen las preguntas así como, como preguntas de campo. Y eso es lo, lo que hago, lo bonito. Porque uno le da la confianza inmediatamente porque dicen esto, es como campesinos hacen las preguntas. Lo que vamos a entregar al, al finalizar este proyecto es un estudio y es una metodología ¿ya? que pudiese ser replicable a otras comunidades indígenas, no solamente en nuestro país, sino en, otra, en otros países. Eh, eh, porque pensamos que si logramos encontrar la solución de cómo potenciar la cultura a través de la tecnología, vamos a abrir espacio a que este desarrollo se replique en otras comunidades, que sea respetuoso con la naturaleza, con la gente que vive allá, eh, que este modelo participativo de que hemos hecho énfasis en todas las etapas del proyecto, eh, realmente eh, se pueda valorar un impacto positivo al final. Nosotros tenemos un enorme capital histórico ahí dentro de la cultura de mapuche, dentro del cómo hacen el día a día. Y ese es el que hay que tratar de preservar. Nuestros proyectos están orientados a, a, hacer, a, a generar tecnología, pero también tenemos que generar ese capital, o sea, tratar de preservar ese capital cultural que tenemos. 
Es en el plazo de un año y medio que el equipo espera tener los resultados de las condiciones climáticas para avanzar en la implementación de las microredes, que complementarán el actual sistema de energía eléctrica con el que cuentan ambas comunidades. Bueno, well, uh... This is the methodology, is co-participative co methodology that we implemented, uh, and there there was a lot of interviews with the community and co uh, uh, participatory map made made with them about the the energy usage and al along the year and in different parts of the community. Uh, well, we we. We make the design uh, and uh, an evaluation of the wind and solar sources, the microgrid plane on Homero Plo, and uh, design a, a, a wireless sensor network. That was a, a, a big problem because the, there is a very mountainous uh, land. You, you don't have a line of sight uh, from two different points uh, in, in any part. Uh, you, you can see in here uh, how is the the mountains there is a lot of mountain when you go there it is very difficult to go from one part to another part we, we make an overfitted uh, system with a lot of routers but uh, in, in later we we change this with a, a more sparse uh, network for, with lesser routers uh, well We, we were uh, making a system with power meter, sensor for well, water levels, uh, cutter location, and display of data. We implemented something, in, for example, in, in the in the place where they 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 have the, their meetings. We we make a micro grid uh, installed uh, with a, a wind generation and uh, cells cell power cells. Uh, and some of this is uh, reported in the paper with uh, Rodrigo Palma in the proceeding of the I2Play. Uh, what, what lesson learned with this project? Uh, we, we need a, there is a high cost of the solution uh, for go to the implementation stage. Uh, we need more funding uh, and the funding uh, will we, we lose a lot of time preparing a funny proposal but uh, well some of them uh, were not accepted so we shrink this to a proposal uh, with a small problem uh, people uh, of the community have a particular link with the environment and the cleaning energies are very attuned with the mapuche culture but they need to be affordable After they, uh, the water use for the land farming is the most demanding energy source in the rural communities. Uh, this is the, the the problem. They need to put water to tanks, and the tanks uh, use that for for irrigation. Uh, uh, well, these they have wells. The, the, the wells are normally shared be, be, between uh, very com uh, few commoners and they they pump the the water to the tanks the the ta the, the water uh, also is a, a scarce resource because when there is a, a lot of rain the, the the wells are full but in the uh, in the drain uh, stages uh, uh, well you do have problems Well, we make a, a proposal for a water energy water management system where we can store uh, energy in the form of, of water in the in, in the in the system, but also plan for the future. Uh, we need to uh, to separate the problem into problem a medium term problem that is. Uh, Focused in the uh, optimize the production in 28 days, 30 days, with a one day timestamp, and in the short term uh, we manage the, the the irrigation system uh, with the volumen uh, set point required for the medium term problem, and 
uh, updating this this problem. Well, this is a project that we are actually working on. Uh, we make the 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 theoretical uh, review and the simulation uh, and the simulation are quite good for a, a, a greenhouse a greenhouse with the characteristics that are implemented in the, in the community uh, and the results are informed uh, are reported in this uh, publication and the Wuchi waters system based on predictive control apply uh, in the applied science, the, this this publication uh, is from 2020. Uh, remarks: uh, Well, we we use some crops that are typical of them, and not of the crops has the the minimum requirements. Uh, so, uh, well, the precipitation level are a problem. This is uh, has to be with the 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 change the the, the climate change uh, we we have maybe uh, sometimes a lot of uh, of rains but there is a lot of days without uh, any rain so they they have problems of uh, they, they 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 have problem with the water uh, the water is a resource not only the wine but the water is also a, a scarce resource uh, this system has the flexibility to different crops. Uh, well, uh, and the methodology developers into uh, we, we try to apply this in in the in a real uh, in a in a real uh, greenhouse. We are working that uh, actually we are implementing the, this approach. Uh, this is the community. Well, you you can see that. This mean of transportation is very green. <laughs> and here we, we have some greenhouses. Uh, and the, the system is like this one. We pump the water to the tank. The tank uh, make a irrigation system to the, to the greenhouse. Uh, we have a solar panels to, to refill the, the batteries, the bank of batteries. And uh, we make this with an uh, with a predictive control approach in order to optimize the resource of solar uh, and the the water stored in the in, in the in the in the walls. This is the optimization function for the short term the, of the energy management system. And we have uh, some restrictions from the pump search uh, for the water tank level and the state energy. Uh, well, we have storing water and energy, water in the, in the tank and energy in the batteries. Uh, and the medium term is about the maximization of the crop, uh, uh, the, 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 the the crop year uh, and uh, uh, the crop revenue. Like uh, the idea is uh, to to have a lot of uh, to maximize the, the the production of crops uh, in order to fulfill the the water that is needed. More could damage the crops. Less can uh, damage the crop also. But lot uh, if you excess uh, water is a cost. Well, for the MPC, multi control, uh, we need to estimate the, the future of the, the, uh, of the meteorological variables. So in this kind, we use some uh, phenomenological model in order to estimate uh, the need of water and the, and the climate waters and the, the climate variables. Uh, well, the, the flow of uh, uh, the, the flow of uh, uh, energy is 
Uh, we have in here we have an exchange of energy of temperature between the the, the, the soil and the, the crop. The crop evaporates water, the water goes out of the greenhouse uh, and the head also go out and go in from the outside. And there is a radiation uh, flow that in ingress to the to the greenhouse. This is the external temperature uh, and the prediction of meteor uh, the, of external uh, solar radiation. They have a big impact on the crops. Well, our main results are the meteorological variable are, uh, uh, are needed to, to make a, a good prediction and a good uh, management of of the water inside the greenhouse and, uh, and we need to uh, optimize a, a function uh, in order to maximize well the, 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 the production of the crops but with a minimum uh, cost in water and in energy. Uh, this is our one of the greenhouse in where we are working is not high tech, but the high tech is hidden in the sensors and and the, the computers. And this is our main group. This is Hermes Garcia. We we have a, well. This is a guy that is. A, uh, we, we need to, to have a guy inside the, the community. We, uh, actually, we, we have a, a lot of uh, people inside the community that uh, are working uh, very close with us, but this, uh, this person is very young and, and has a, 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 a tremendous perspective of how they can use uh, the technology with the... With the the vision of maintaining the, the Mapuche culture. Uh, these are some students, Alvaro Endo, Sebastian Parra, and Martina Casanova. Some are from electrical engineering and some are from agronomic engineering. Uh, well, this is me. This is Juan Ignacio, a professor of the Universidad de la Frontera. Uh, this is Doris Ay, our chef in, in this project. Uh, she, she's the Lonco hat, we said, Lonco is the head of uh, the, the project uh, head. Uh, and Roberto Nande, he, he, he was, uh, he passed away uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, he was our anthropologist. Uh, we, we regret, we miss him a lot. He teach a lot of to us about how we can uh, get inside the community, uh, and uh, well, we miss him. Well, that is my that was my presentation. Thank you for give my uh, language, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, for that presentation, Carlos. Uh, it's very interesting to see the relationship with the with a different community to the to the last presentation. Um, I've got one question that's that's come through uh, for you, uh, and this is relating to the um, to, to the growing of the of the crops. And you were saying that you optimize the yield of the crop. Uh, and looking at the use of water. Are you doing that for each hectare or is the amount of land not so important? Well, actually we are doing that for the greenhouse, not for the open open crops, uh, open field crops. Uh, inside the, the greenhouse, and the greenhouse are small greenhouse as you've seen in, in this photograph. They, they are about uh, 20 meters long for uh, uh, eight meters wide. So they are not so big, but the, uh, the, 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 
the energy for water pumping is very big for the small uh, wallets of the conveners. So, so they, they appreciate a lot of to, to have a, a system that is uh, cheap to, to cultivate the crops. And the water, well, they, they have, sometimes they, they have a lot of problem with the water, but it's because uh, of, of the change of, clim uh, of weather, of climate. Yes, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I understand. And yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, if there are other questions for Carlos, uh, please could you put those in the chat uh, and uh, we, we'll deal with those uh, you, you, using the, the, the chat function. Um, but uh, at this point, I would like to really thank Carlos for his presentation uh, and for his insight uh, in, into the, the projects around energy and water, uh, particularly with the Mapuche uh, population. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. we're, we're doing really well with time. So uh, our, our next presenter is, is Martha um, for, from uh, Guatemala uh, with a presentation um, associated with uh, educating girls uh, in a sustainable future. Um, Martha is uh, a member of the um, MAIA leadership team, uh, which is the only uh, organization in Guatemala that's designed and led by uh, indigenous women that serves the uh, Maya communities um, and as director of special projects she designs and implements uh, culturally attuned uh, high impact projects focusing on education uh, and empowerment uh, of the female population. Um, so I think uh, she's also the first uh, Mayor Kekalachi uh, woman to teach the Chinese language at uh, public and elite institutions in Guatemala. Uh, and she's working through various uh, funded programs, particularly with, uh, with the Embassy of, ta uh, of Taiwan um, and the Rural University in Guatemala. So I, I will hand over uh, to, to Martha to, to give her presentation. Thank you very much for being here uh, and uh, we're, we're looking forward uh, to your presentation. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. Yes, I'm going to, to start sharing my screen. Let's see. Yeah, we, we, have, we have your presentation. That's good. Okay. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Marta Lidia Oshichui. I am from Guatemala, and I am also, uh, well, as a little bit, as Patrick mentioned, something like, that I would like to highlight from myself. It's like I'm from uh, rural communities of Guatemala. Uh, my parents are actually, uh, my, my mom is a housekeeper, and my dad is an agriculture. Um, and I, um, I study most of my time here in Guatemala, but I also had the opportunity to, to, to get a scholarship to, to study abroad, which has actually also provided me like a, a deep insight about the progress international level, but also like the challenges that we have in Guatemala. And I, right now I work for an organization called Maya. And it's actually, it's actually, it sounds like a, a Maya, like a Maya people, but also it's spelled M-A-I-A. -A. And uh, we are providing education for young women of the rural areas of Guatemala, most of them indigenous. And we believe that educating girls, it's also like, um, it's a way to reach sustainability. And so we have a lot of challenges here, but. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm also glad to, to learn from each of the projects that you were presenting. As uh, Raquel said, uh, we had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, a couple years ago, and I think this also has been like a, a network and a relationship that has been growing, and uh, we're just happy to share these spaces and also share our insights and, 
And it, I think it's nice to have this uh, opportunity to see projects from around the globe, but also emphasis, emphasis in uh, uh, Latin America. And I would like to also play a video. Imagine if you were born into a fate of living in the shadows. You have a four strikes against you when you take your first breath. You are a poor, you are a girl, you live in a rural village, and you are a Maya. You are an afterthought. By time you are 18, you are five times more likely to be a mother than a high school graduate. And only 1% of your peers will enroll in university. Guatemala has one of the worst gender equality gaps in all of Americas. It is a country full of potential, but is confronted with many threats, poverty, corruption, Unfortunately, we seem to have lost Martha at the moment. Uh, if you just bear with us, we will see what we can do. We'll just give her a moment to see if she comes back online. Okay, we seem to have lost Martha. Um, what we might do is move on to um, to the fifth presentation, uh, which is going to be given by myself uh, and Rodrigo, uh, and come back to um, Martha's presentation, uh, assuming that she rejoins us uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, Rodrigo, I, I'm really hoping that that's okay with you, uh, and if you could share our presentation that would be great so we're taking presentations four and five in the wrong order um, so i'm going to introduce this presentation uh, and and some of the work we've been doing as part of a project with the uh, with the british embassy um, in uh, in santiago um, and rodrigo is going to talk uh, more in detail about his work on this project and some of the solutions uh, that, that uh, have been developed. Um, so Rodrigo is uh, received his uh, mechatronics degree and his uh, Master of um, Engineering Sciences degree uh, in 2015 and 2019 respectively uh, and he is currently pursuing, pursuing his PhD in Systems Engineering. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I, I'm Professor Pat Wheeler uh, and I work with the University of Nottingham and I'm also the Executive Director of the University of Nottingham, Chile. Uh, I'm just wondering if Rodrigo can make the presentation full screen. Oh, it's all okay as, as we are. Um, you working? Hi. Hi, Pat. Hi, good. I'm pleased to see you here. Um, so, this presentation is about microgrid technologies for rural communities um, in Chile. Uh, Rodrigo, if you could move on to the next slide for me. So, so, um, so the first part of this talk is just looking at the context 
uh, and the rationale um, for this project. So the project is uh, a joint project between the University of Nottingham, Chile uh, and the Universidad de Talca in Carrico uh, and it's funded by the British Embassy uh, in Santiago uh, with links back to, uh, to companies in the UK. So a big thank you to the British Embassy team for their support and encouragement during this project. Uh, we've been looking at a, a target location uh, in the Maui region uh, of Chile, so near where the Universidad de Talca is based. Um, and we're looking at rural and agricultural um, applications as part of a, a principle of grow back better uh, after the COVID pa uh, pandemic. So how can we ensure that rural communities, particularly agricultural communities, um, receive the, the sorts of, of technology that are, are adaptable and maintainable in those locations that address the issues around energy poverty um, and allow the, those communities to grow uh, in terms of economics and sustainability, particularly in the, the worlds of agriculture, very much as we've been hearing in the last presentation, uh, but in a way that doesn't damage the environment. Uh, so looking at uh, developing areas of the country and the access to electrical engineering, uh, electricity. So the focus has been on design, the implementation and the control of the microgrids uh, as a way of ensuring appropriate technology for these rural deployment. And that includes, as well as the control and the, 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 the clever implementation, it's looking at things like maintenance, cost of ownership, lifetime, um, and the range of scenarios and operating conditions uh, that we might have um, under those conditions. So um, at that point, I, I will hand over uh, to Rodrigo, who is going to take us through some of the work that he's been doing uh, on this project uh, and some of the solutions he's been implementing. So Rodrigo, uh, over to you. Thank you, Bart. Uh, uh, well. Uh, in this, uh, the proposed uh, topology is in here. The, the, in the fifth place, we have a PV panel. Uh, then uh, we have a SEPIC converter for uh, the MPPT uh, application. Uh, we use a Pertur and Observe uh, uh, MPPT. Uh, then uh, we have a battery for uh, the energy stored, and then uh, we have a bus converter. Uh, the bus converter increases the voltage to a uh, um, medium voltage, uh, um, for example, uh, 300 volt or another uh, reference voltage. And then we have the DC link, uh, and this in, in the DC link we can connect a DC load or a, a inverter uh, plus a LCL filter. And this this is the topology that was uh, well, was uh, well, uh, were proposed in this uh, in this project, and this it was implemented. Uh, the subsystem function in the first place we can see the SEBIC converter. The SEBIC converter uh, allows the tracking the maximum power point uh, in the PV, uh, PV system and uh, the energy store. Then a battery is the where the energy is in storage and the the bus converter write the volt and the DC link allow the connection of the DC link uh, or uh, inverter. Uh, the uh, inverter plus uh, LCL filter produce a high uh, a sinusoidal access signal. Uh, yeah? This is the uh, topology implemented in this world. The control strategy for strategy for the the control of the different converter, the SEPIT and the BOSS, uh, is uh, uh, we use a PE control. 
with a uh, SAT uh, uh, linearization for the control of the converter. Uh, the, the idea of the SAT linearization is based on the cancellation uh, of the of uh, known linearities in a known linear system using a new definition of uh, input. In other words, we obtain an <coughs> easy plant in, in a, we can see an um, inter integrator uh, has a transfer function uh, that represents the converter. Uh, for the set, the set is different to the boss, but in, in general, we obtain this. Uh, transfer function uh, and then and then it's possible to make a uh, easy pay of uh, easy uh, tuning pay and, and that is the the good and that is the good of this uh, control strategy uh, because uh, convert uh, converter and DCC are very complicated and nonlinear uh, system. Uh? And in the bottom of this picture, we can see the control of the uh, of the current for the for our uh, current in the uh, L1 uh, inductor in a SEBIC converter. The SEBIC converter is present here. Um, it's a classic uh, SEBIC converter, and we can. And we uh, we have the control of the sorry we have the control of the uh, current in the L1 inductor, in the inductor of the input uh, of the SEPIC converter. Uh, the setup implemented is shown here. Uh, we can see. Uh, uh, the SEPIC converter in one, uh, the BOSS converter uh, in two, the inverter, the LCL filter, and uh, the battery band. That is the setup for test the, the control strategy. Mm -hmm. And the SEPIC converter, uh, the topology, has the PV in the input and we can see the current of the PV and the voltage. Then we have the component, inductor, capacitor, and the switch, and final, finally the battery. And this is a, this converter possibility. Uh, the the implementation of the MPBT. In this case, we use a perturb and observe uh, algorithm uh, for uh, tracking the maximum point in a PV uh, curve, in a PV system. Uh, the SEPIC converter control strategy shown here, uh, we can see the uh, uh, internal loop and uh, the internal loop uh, pos uh, allow the control of the current in the inductor uh, uh, one of the set converter. The reference is uh, produced by the uh, MPPT block. The MPPT block had uh, uh, the, the voltage of the PV and the current of the PV. How, uh, how, uh, how input, uh, and then the, the algorithm uh, track the maximum power point and, and produce the current reference for the control of the current. Uh, and this is a control block uh, with a static linearization. Uh, the static linearization is uh, shown here uh, in the block. Uh, and then uh, produce the, the control signal for uh, the control of the SEPIC converter. And the ACE is uh, compared with a triangular uh, signal and produce the, uh, the signal to control the SEPIC converter. That is the control strategy 
sedative for the uh, control and implement the, the MPVT uh, in the system. And, uh, the next uh, slide present the experimental result uh, in fifth place in the top we can see uh, how the how the uh, MPVT work and we can see the typical waveform uh, the voltage in the PV the PV voltage sorry and the uh, current the current PV and the power of the PV system and we use a, a PV uh, in this case uh, the maximum power is uh, uh, 240 uh, watt mm. in the fuel in the picture of, of bottom we can see uh, how is the who is the work for a low PV power? The maximum power here is 20 watt. And we can see the typical oscillation in turn, uh, the typical oscillation in the maximum power point of the PV. This is the, these are the, the result for the semi converter. And the next picture, we can see the uh, bus converter uh, is the classic uh, bus converter with a uh, one switch and a diode. And the input uh, is the the input voltage is the voltage uh, voltage of the uh, battery bank the battery bank for this uh, war was a uh, 24 volt and this is the the topology is a simple bulk converter but in this uh, work we use uh, the sun linearization for the control of this converter and uh, the control strategy is present here uh, we can see uh, two loop the internal loop and external loop. The internal loop uh, allows the control of the current and the, the current we can see here uh, the current reference uh, is this current. And the external loop uh, allows the control of the uh, uh, output of voltage of the bus converter. The reference uh, is is elevate to uh, to do and this is the the control and the internal load uh, is uh, implemented with a sat linearization and the uh, transfer fun transfer function for the 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 external load uh, that represent the external and uh, all the, the converter is present in, in the top of this uh, uh, slide. Uh, this is the transfer foot and uh, we can see the, uh, the control strategy implementing this uh, in this work. The result, uh, uh, we can see here the experimental result of the DC link voltage of the bus converter. We can see a different step to 15, 100, and 100 and 15 volts and the uh, inductor current. The control is the control work uh, perfect for different. You know, different condition, sorry, for different uh, reference, we can see the same, the similar uh, uh, result for, for the control. That, that this is uh, the, the experimental result test. And 
the next uh, picture present the experimental process for the assay output voltage. And we can see uh, a big, a big uh, window here. Uh, and we can see uh, as soon to the, con the output voltage as, in, as AC, and uh, we can see the correct performance of the control. And, in, and finally, in the bottom, we can see uh, a step to the output voltage. We, con we are controlling uh, this uh, voltage, the DC, DC link voltage. Mm -hmm. The results uh, are very good. And finally, we uh, show we choose uh, the waveform of the microwave. We can see the output uh, AC voltage, uh, the voltage in the PV, the power in the PV, and the current. That are the waveform of this uh, world. And finally, the conclusion, the SAT uh, linearization allows the correct control of the converter that are, for example, a rural microgrid or another kind of topology. The result and different test conditions support and the proposed solution in a microgrid uh, powered by a photovoltaic panel or another kind of energy source. Uh, and in the PV, in the photovoltaic panel, uh, the tracking of the maximum PowerPoint is very good uh, through the, this uh, control strategy. These are the conclusion uh, of this uh, work. For uh, any question, uh, if the question is very big, please send me an email. But the yeah, but. If the question is uh, simple, please, uh, here, please. For further question, please send me an email of this work. Okay. Um, Rodrigo, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, it, it's worth pointing out that this, uh, this equipment is actually based, you know, it, it's standalone and, and, and based in a, in a representative uh, location. Um, there's been a question uh, on the text there um, asking about the reason for the DC link voltage not being constant. Is that something you can just comment on uh, on why you why you've chosen a design where the DC link voltage uh, is not a constant value? Uh, the, sorry. Uh, I need to read the, the question, please. I'll tell you what, uh, um, I'd like to get back to Martha's presentation. I suggest, could, could you answer that question in the chat function? Is that okay? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. It's more easy for, for a good answer. Yes, I understand. That's, that's fine. Um, Martha, it's very good to see you back. Um, for the audience, we'll deal with any questions on uh, Rodrigo's pres presentation uh, and that project um, in the chat function. Uh, Martha, would you would you like to share your screen uh, and continue with your presentation? I understand that there were some technical problems that, uh, that caused your disappearance, but the floor is again yours. Yes, can can Aliaga, can you please close your presentation, please? Thank you. Yes, my apologies. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to resume where, where I left with the video. Imagine if you were born into a fate of living in the shadows, 
you have a four strikes against you. When you take your first breath, you are a poor, you are a girl, you live in a rural village, and you are a Maya. You are an afterthought. By time you are 18, you are five times more likely to be a mother than a high school graduate. And only 1% of your peers will enroll in university. Guatemala has one of the worst gender equality gaps in all of Americas. It is a country full of potential, but is a confronted with the many threats, poverty, corruption, mass migration. How can a country even begin to overcome these massive challenges when the potential of millions of citizens and the solution they could share remain trapped in the shadows? No soy el problema, soy la solución. We know that almost every measure of development improves exponentially when more girls go to the school and participate fully in society. The economy grows, the environment is cleaner, children are healthier, the world is safer. Changing faith and escaping the shadows requires a bold new trajectory. That is why we in Maya call our students girl pioneers. We find the girls and the families who have the courage and the grit to challenge the status quo. We exist to connect their talents with the opportunities that will transform their community and our world. This begins with the Maya Impact School. The award-winning Maya Impact School is Central America's first secondary school, specifically designed to unlock the potential of young indigenous women. Opened in 2017, we are redefining the word school in Guatemala. We propel talent of young women out to the shadows and into the spotlight. Through powerful partnership, the Impact School draws cutting edge methodologies from around the world. We are using curricula and teaching techniques never before seen in rural Guatemala. Our vision is to provide an education that leads to a choice field life after graduation. All of us in the school, from leaders to teachers, are on a similar journey as the students. We know that each girl pioneer will face a lifetime of headwinds. As a part of the school, we equip her with the powerful internal resources and information to sustain the bold trajectory, resiliency, critical thinking, an empowered voice, and love for learning. Maya achieves success with the families, not in spite of them. We know that for a girl pioneer to thrive, her family must journey with her. Many of the parents are unfamiliar with school. Our team of mentors regularly visit families and help them build a vision of the future with their daughter. Mentors keep families motivated and engaged. This way, girl pioneers do not have a choose between their family and the opportunity. They can have both. Maya knows that when girl pioneers decide their own faith, we all win. When young women have a knowledge, resources, and support to influence and lead change, we all benefit from their unique perspectives and talents. For that reason, Maya is not only a school, but also a hub of innovation. We share our best practices with dozens of schools and organizations every year. Maya is showing the world the power of girl pioneers. Join us as we unlock her infinite impact. And thank you. Imagine Just give me go back. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we're located in one of the areas of Sololá that it's being concentrated by indigenous population, and it has the highest rate of malnutrition, poverty, and um, lack of access to education. So this is one of the main reasons why Maya was, uh, the, the impact school was open. And uh, just a little bit of the context as well, only 10% of indigenous Maya girls graduate from high school in Guatemala. And by age of 20, over 50% of indigenous girls have also become uh, mothers. And so we start with the question, how far she can go? And as the video show a little bit, uh, we know that uh, girls, and uh, no matter where they are, but the girls are ambitious, they are talented, they, are, they come from low-income families, marginalized communities, and uh, there are, they face so many challenges, but also we know that with their talent, they can build their own trajectory, and also they can work, for, like they can work forward or towards prosperity and equal opportunities. And so proof of this, and, uh, and that's where we actually met with the other peers, uh, in this case with Raquel. Uh, Maya also was recognized with the Site Sustainability Prize in 2019. So we see here one of our uh, young students, uh, her name is Esther, and Esther was actually able to attend this, um, uh, this uh, week of sustainability in Abu Dhabi. And so about our project, uh, we're pleased to say, and we're very honored and also happy, the school and the project, it's been designed, led and run by the same gender, like all of uh, most of the team. 86% uh, are female, 82 indigenous, and 34% of the teams are, the, from the member of the teams are graduate from our previous program. So this is like, we opened this school in 2017, but before this, we had a, a we had a different program. It was a mentorship program, and so some of the students who graduated from the mentorship program are already working with us, and they are also like the the role is right now like a mentoring and also educating uh, the students from this area. So we, this is like a a huge progress for us and also like a good example. Uh, our goal in Guatemala, it's also to redefine a school in Guatemala, access to uh, high quality education, academics and community family engagement program. Um, Guatemala in these areas, uh, there are um, there are schools of ele elementary schools, but after elementary schools, there are only few uh, schools for secondary. So if we take a look, not everyone has the access to go to a public secondary school. So this is also one of the reasons that Maya opens. Uh, Maya is providing um, scholarships to students. Right now we have 236 students in, uh, in school. And the four goals that we're working towards are, uh, we want the students to be economically independent. After so one day to start and choose their own family or to start their own family at their own terms at the age of 25, at least. We want them to also become the next leaders of their communities, but also Guatemala, like a different, uh, a different, uh, uh, leadership with critical thinking and also like a vision to, to change the current situation of Guatemala and a uh, lifelong learning. So we are working also towards the students to get or to reach at least 15 years of formal education. About our model, uh, so we believe when Maya girls are able to match their talent and ambition with the new learning opportunities and experience, their lives take on a bold new trajectory. So we already have a, a excellent example so that says that girl can do it and we have uh, all the talent, uh, but we need opportunities to actually 
uh, demonstrate or to be part of the change, we need access to opportunities and we also need resources. Uh, a little bit more about our sustainability project. Um, when we actually won the SIET Sustainability Prize, so one of the main focus that, that the school took was uh, projects uh, that, were, that are related to, envirom to the environment. And um, we started, so if you actually take a look at these two pictures, at the beginning, we did not have any, um, any green areas at school, but little by little, we've been working towards this for two years already. And so students are, uh, so we have a garden at school and students are in charge of the garden, but also like everything that we are producing from the garden goes to the kitchen. And uh, for this year, because we, due to COVID, most of the schools have been open and closed, that it's a really uh, unfortunate situation. Uh, but when we're not able to have students here, so we prepare um, nutritional baskets and we send the, the uh, harvest from the organic garden to families uh, that actually <clears throat> are in need. So we have identified among the group of families of the 236 families that we have, we have identified uh, like at least 30% of them who are who have lost their jobs during the uh, during the uh, du during this uh, crisis, and we have also noticed. And I don't know if you know or how well you know Guatemala, but we are a small country. But we also are. Uh, we have all sorts of uh, challenges. Um, we have droughts or heavy rains. So we, the area where we are located, so we either we either get hit by uh, heavy rains or hurricanes, or sometimes we have no water. So we have a lot of uh, challenges also. And so we are supporting the families through the garden of the impact school. And also one thing that we notice, uh, these are mainly findings that students are actually, uh, well, I'm sure you also could share this with me, but they enjoy when they are part of being, uh, of the planning or in the process, but they want to take, uh, they want their ideas to be considered. So we also have like a Sayed or a Maya, Maya Sayed uh, committee, and they are also supporting or they are also in charge of leading uh, some of the projects at school. And one of the projects for this year, it's the implementation of uh, chickens like a, like small farms like a very small farm a school farm uh, and we're hoping to also to manage our own um or kitchen waste uh, right now we don't have uh, students in school but we hope uh, once this situation is going to improve we are also asking the ministry of education to to support us and to allow us to continue uh, education at school we have all the resource and also the protocols set up so we can continue with uh, education at school. And another project that we uh, undertook last year, uh, it's like uh, the solar energy. And this is also a lot being done through international cooperation. So we're very uh, happy and we are very uh, honored to work with a, a few international organizations. Last year, we partnered with the Honol Foundation. And our project is, uh, as, you, as you can see, it's a photovoltaic system. And uh, right now, our school is 100% solar power. And with this, we are also able to, um, uh, to provide workshops for the, for the entire team. Also, we're hoping to provide, um, due to COVID-19, we have not been able to do this, but we're hoping to provide uh, uh, workshops for, uh, for the team, for students, and also for parents. We're going to do this uh, like a year by year. We are not able to do this at uh, everything in one year, but we're hoping for this year to work with 50 students and also 50 uh, parents. So the and the idea is also to talk about like a renewable energy and uh, like uh, also to consider the benefits of utilizing 
uh, solar energy. And this is a topic, and I, I also know that some of you have mentioned before, but we see also, or at least we experience the, at some point, resistance from the, um, from the energy company, the electricity company. It took us quite a long time to be able to get all the, um, paperwork in, in place. So it was uh, a long, I would say like a fairly long process. Uh, the implementation of the system itself was really quick, but like the paperwork, it took us a little bit more of time. And we noticed uh, like a huge savings. And uh, so it's totally worth it. And the idea is also for the students to be able to, one, to, to learn about uh, renewable energy, but cost and benefits, but also like to think uh, outside the box. We know that there are so many challenges. Uh, some of our students are actually not able to have <laughs> electricity at home. So there are definitely a lot of challenges around the area. And we want in as, uh, as the school aim, also we want our students to be like the next uh, community leaders to start making the changes in their community. So a lot of this, it's for them to learn about uh, all of this uh, technology and all of these resources that we have and how to take, uh, how to, to, to actually take advantage of them, but also how to, how we can together as community to continue and uh, taking care of the environment as well. And also due to COVID-19, we, um, uh, Guatemala was closed on March 16th. And we also noticed um, in, during the first month uh, that a lot of families were losing their jobs and their main, uh, their, their main means of income was uh, either working outside home or going to the city. And so due to this, we started the implementation of uh, family organic gardens. And we were able to implement uh, about 180 uh, family organic gardens last year. And we did this a, with, uh, with uh, workshops. We mainly uh, took into consideration the mothers. And uh, so most of the moms came here. We have, this was with emphasis on nutrition, uh, also like in um, um, like, uh, ancient techniques and also native techniques that are in the area, but sometimes we, we have like lost them because of one or another reason. So, but we're trying to kind of uh, also go learn from, uh, from our ancient practices, but also try to use technology uh, along the way. And, uh, but it's important to educate the population. We, we, are, we know and we're aware that most of the mothers, they only had as much as two years of education in elementary school. So there is a huge need for uh, also to, like, to transfer knowledge. But a few things that we notice uh, through this process is like number one, it's important to include the families. Uh, although the, the workshops were meant for mothers, but uh, the fact that the, they can, go work, they can go back to home and work with their kids or the rest of the families. It was a really positive activity for them. And uh, adding to the learning process and also full security, I think uh, we saw really good results. Uh, a few of the challenges as well in this particular project is like uh, most of the families or water is definitely an issue. Not, not everyone or all the communities have water. And also, um, and also we, we saw that uh, mothers started to, 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 one of the most, um, I would say, I would say like, I don't know, inspiring part for us was like the fact when mothers start, started to be able to eat from, from their garden. Although the gardens are not that uh, big because some of the families actually lack of, uh, a place where they can plant <laughs> or harvest uh, uh, products. So they they try to find like different ways, like small, uh, small areas where they can actually plant or try to be creative, but it's definitely a challenge because uh, some families just do not have a space. They are renting spaces, so they do, they do not have a, 
uh, like a huge area or a, a big enough area where they can actually implement what, what they learn with us. And uh, uh, some of the success uh, from uh, for Maya, and these are some of the examples that keep inspiring us day after day, and also the proof that uh, that when you actually provide these opportunities to the girls, they would naturally flourish. Uh, so a couple of examples: Jessica Maribel also traveled to Abu Dhabi in 2020 in 2020 last year. And because they also are learning English in here in, in school, so she was able to present in Abu Dhabi and her, her presentation was in English. Uh, so this is like a huge part for us. Uh, I, I know that I'm focusing a lot of education, but education is definitely an important piece of this process and for the development of any country. And so like when, when the students get to school, some of them barely, <clears throat> barely speak Spanish because our, our native language is Cachiquel. Then they learn how to write and how to read Cachiquel because we don't learn that at school as well because it's school in Guatemala, it's not that uh, inclusive. Uh, so in school, they learn almost three languages. They, they learn how to write and read in Cachiquel. They also learn Spanish, most of them. And also like um, they, are, they started to learn English. So right now, most of the high, uh, high school students, they are already speaking like a B1 English. And uh, we also know that this is going to be very important for them once they graduate from school in terms of opening job opportunities for them. It's going to English is definitely one. one uh, <laughs> it opens uh, opportunities. It's an international language. And it actually, it's open. It, this is like what's opening also to me the opportunity to be here and sharing with, with you today. And another example is uh, Claudia Marisol. Uh, what she learned from school last year in the workshops of organic um, uh, <clears throat> gardening. So she applied for uh, uh, a program. It's called Ella Impacta in, in Guate City. And her project was based on <clears throat> sustainable gardens as well. So she actually won the first place uh, nationally with her project. And she also got like a uh, seed funding for her project to be implemented. So she actually, so we see here, Claudia Melisol, she's working on her project. And uh, I think it's just so uh, inspiring for us and also highly motivating to see like they are working already for their communities. And this is something like, uh, it, it definitely takes time because it's, it's a process. But uh, by the fact that we are able to demonstrate that uh, Guatemala or girls have uh, that capacity, but we, we need resources and also opportunity to be able to make these uh, changes that we need in society. So our theory is if we're able to impact or to provide her um, opportunities, so we see that her economy is going to be benefit her family and she's going to learn at least she's going to school for at least 15 years and she's going definitely back to her community and this is going to impact her family because her kids once in the future when she has her kids she she's going to be able to provide them better opportunities like in my case right now I have uh, two two daughters I have twin daughters and uh, they definitely have uh, and I'm expecting that they should have less hardships than uh, what I had when I was little. And, uh, <clears throat> and also she would, she would be able to bring back to her community uh, economic prosperity. And also we can work towards a, um, a more inclusive society and also uh, a more just society for women as well. That's something that we, right now, uh, Guatemala has one of the... <laughs> I mean, a very bad statistics regarding uh, violence against women and violence in general. So, and also like if we see that the after all impact is going to benefit the whole society, the, the country and, and the world. Uh, I just wanted to also emphasize that we don't do this by ourselves. 
um, a lot of uh, what we have uh, uh, were able to do in Guatemala. It's uh, it's thanks to the uh, all all of the organizations who are supporting us. Uh, we have a few in the United States. <clears throat> Also, like <clears throat> this opportunity brings us visibility and also uh, also the opportunity to bring our voice uh, outside that uh, uh, outside the country, and uh, we believe that this is a this is a huge project, but also it's a, it's a challenging for us because we're very small. We would like to to have a, a bigger impact or at least to have a lot of schools like Maya in all Guatemala, but it's it's actually in terms of um, of um, uh, funding it it requires also like a, a funding and work and partnerships so we are very thankful with all the partnership who uh, who have supported us during all this uh, like 12 years the, of of journey that maya has and uh, this is my presentation thank you matios sieseni y muchas gracias Right. Thank you very much for the uh, the presentation. Uh, that was great. Uh, thank you. Um, very interesting and uh, certainly inspiring. Um, the one question I've got I've got so far uh, for you is is how do you measure the success of these programs? How do you decide they've been <laughs> successful, and how do you report that back to your to your funders? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I didn't speak about like the all the programs that we have in, inside Maya. One of the program as well, it's like the social emotional program, and that's fifty percent of what Maya does. Uh, one of the ways that we measure is just like <clears throat> uh, retention rate. We have like a ninety-eight percent of retention rate. The commitment that we have with parents are of six years commitment. So like but the fact that we have like a 98 retention rate means that um, our students are not leaving. So we, we have them here uh, with us for, this is our fifth year. And we're keeping this retention rate, uh, even with the impacts of uh, COVID, we see like a lot of like, like retention rate has dropped from public schools and other organizations, but we're managing to, to keep the schools in, to, to be able to keep the girls in schools. Uh, we also have uh, the opportunity to have platforms inside of the inside of uh, Maya. Like we have a platform for for monitoring the progress in uh, in math, in English. So we do this like constantly, try to monitor like the the uh, how much they are growing per year. Um, basically, these are like right now the two the two key measurements that we do. We do academic also on retention rate. Uh, we have we would have our first impact assessment next year once we finish the the first like group or the first cohort of students. Uh, but yeah, so we're working towards like how many students are going to be able to pass like the national universe the national evaluation. Uh, schools in the area, the only two out of ten pa are passing the national evaluation for uh, language. And only one of 10 students is uh, is passing the evaluation of math. So we're definitely looking forward to, to have um, better, um, uh, better results from our school. And also one of the ways that we're looking or, or we're expecting from the program is how many students are able to pass the uh, evaluation, the entrance evaluation of the university, the national university that is San Carlos. And most of us, like when we were growing up, we used to fail this evaluation because like the quality of education is not, is not good enough. So but we're hoping that uh, at least, I would say like 90, 95% of the, of the students to be able to pass uh, these evaluations. Okay, thank you very much, Martha, for, for, for your presentation um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, great insight. Um, it's really good to, to see the, the, the work that, that you're doing there. Uh, I noticed uh, Raquel has just made a similar comment in the chat. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank all our speakers um, for, for, the, for 
this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are, um, for, for, for your presentations. It's been a fascinating session looking at some of the motivations, the advantages in education, particularly in, in, um, in trying to achieve uh, better gender equality and so on, that the use of electrical energy um, uh, and projects associated with uh, PV uh, and microgrids can achieve. So we've seen that, we've seen working with various different communities and we've seen some of the technologies uh, right down to some of the details of the of the power electronics. So I think we've had a, a really wide ranging seminar uh, with, with some, some great talks and some very thought provoking uh, ideas there. Uh, just to finish, I'd, I'd like to really say some big thank yous. Uh, first of all, to, to uh, Professor Marco Riviera uh, at the Universidad de Talca. Uh, for all his work in uh, bringing um, th this, uh, this seminar together. Um, uh, thank you very much, Marco, for, for all the efforts there. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Veronica and Nicholas for, for guiding us through uh, the process today uh, and, and all the work they're doing behind the scenes. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, like, like most of you, uh, we've received uh, emails from Veronica giving us the uh, uh, information about the event and also the ways uh, of logging in uh, and so on. Uh, and also a really big thank you to the uh, British Embassy in Santiago uh, for supporting this event uh, as, as part of the uh, microgrid project they've been supporting uh, with the uh, University of Nottingham, Chile um, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Universidad de Talca. Uh, and uh, everybody in those organisations, uh, particularly Mariana, for, for all the arrangements she's helped uh, make. So thank you all very, finally, thank you all very much for being here as the audience. Thank you very much for your questions. The presentations and uh, a live recording of today's event uh, will all be available on YouTube. Uh, so, uh, so that that will be available to those people who weren't able to attend today. Um, and, and thank you all very much. Uh, and with that, um, I, I, I'll sign out. Um, Thank you for attending. It's very good to see you all.